Whether you operate one forklift or thousands, one location or hundreds, the new My Toyota customer portal can help you optimize your operation and material handling equipment. This one-stop, free-to-use platform is designed to help you take control of your information and make smarter decisions, all at the touch of a button. Register and access your data today at my.toyotaforklift.com. That's my.toyotaforklift.com. Today's warehouse needs to keep inventory moving smoothly and quickly. Meet these challenges with on-demand warehouse labeling from Brother Mobile Solutions. Our mobile and industrial printers will help optimize your operations to achieve the speed, reliability, and durability your warehouse needs. With easy integration for existing warehouse technology, convenient portability, and upfront affordability, Brother Mobile Solutions is at your side when it comes to warehouse labeling. Try one for free today by visiting brothermobilesolutions.com slash newwarehouse or click the link in the show notes. That's it's brothermobilesolutions.com slash new warehouse to try one for free today. The New Warehouse Podcast, hosted by Kevin Lawton, is your source for insights and ideas from the distribution, transportation, and logistics industry. A new episode every Monday morning brings you the latest from industry experts and thought leaders. And now, here's Kevin. Hey, it's Kevin Lawton with the New Warehouse Podcast, bringing you a new episode today. And on today's episode, I am going to be joined by Jim Shaw. He is the president and co-founder at Zion Solutions Group. And we're going to talk a little bit about Jim's background and how he kind of came to found Zion Solutions Group. We're also going to talk about what do they do. And we're also going to talk about some of the biggest problems that companies are facing in the warehousing and distribution space right now and, and how some of those problems are, are being addressed addressed and a little bit on uh, kind of operational flow and overall kind of what's happening in the industry and the market. So Jim, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good, Kevin. Appreciate you having me on the show. Definitely. Definitely yeah. happy to get you on. And, you know, I know we've been uh, we've been talking about this for a little while, so we're making it happen now. So it's, it's good to get you on here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your your background in the space and, and kind of just overall and and how you came to to found this Zion Solutions Group? Yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to do that. So I usually start. I feel like I've given this this pitch or this speech a lot of times <laughs> when you sure. when you found a new company or when you, when you create a new company, you meet yeah. a lot of new people. And um, while the industry is small, you still have to introduce yourself. And one of my passions is meeting new people, just like you. I think I came yep. up to you, pro man. It's like, man, I know you got a podcast. Yeah. I'd love to get on it sometime. <laughs> and we got a podcast, uh, the Zion yeah. experience. Uh, I'd love to get you back on sometime. We'll, we'll, we'll switch roles one day, but Absolutely. So Jimmy Shaw, who is he? What am I? Um, how do I describe myself? I usually start with, there's really four words that kind of describe me, Kevin, and it's faith, it's family, it's work worth doing, and it's it, in doing adventure, a good adventure. Right. So those four things kind of describe me as a person, who I am. So where I came from, I, I was born and raised in a small farming community in yeah. Kentucky. I live in a little place called Hodgenville, Kentucky. I know people won't be able to see the video here, but you can see behind me this picture of Abe Lincoln that you can see yeah. is Abe Lincoln was born about two miles from where I'm standing. My family oh, okay. has deep roots here. The county's named after my family. We've been here for multiple generations. My entire extended family and my 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 family in general are within about a five to ten mile radius. Mm -hmm. So born and raised in Hodgenville, Kentucky, a little small farming community about an hour south of Louisville, right, right in central Kentucky. My wife, Holly, and I have four children. We decided this is where we wanted to raise our children and had opportunities to to go other places. I'll get to that shortly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but born and raised here, one one high school community, probably ten to thirteen thousand people total. You it's one of those places where everybody kind of knows everybody. It's a real good had a had a real good upbringing, real good community that I've been surrounded with and and that's where we kind of stayed. So 
from there, what do you what do you do? I went to the University of Louisville, which mm-hmm. is right up the road. I'm an industrial engineer. At least I have a piece of paper that says that's what I am. <laughs> and so I went five years at, at the University of Louisville, JB Speed School, industrial engineering. And the day I started college, I started work at UPS. So UPS's main mm-hmm. sorting facility, Worldport, yeah. is in Louisville, Kentucky. And they had a program with the college. They still do. They call it Metro College and Earn and Learn. And I was able to get my education supplemented and and partially paid for by working at UPS. So I started the day I started college, I started UPS, which began my journey 25 years ago in the supply chain logistics industry, you could say. And so I started loading the airplanes on the ramp and I was just an hourly. And then I figured out if I went into management, I got a little bit more educational (laughs) resource help. So yeah. I went in, became a part-time supervisor and uh, stayed that throughout my my college days. And they worked with me, some really great people, UPS worked with me and they, they got me into the industrial engineering department. So UPS has a lot of industrial engineers. Yeah, I wouldn't really call it engineering work because I was more of a, I call it more of a spreadsheet jockey is what I was. I did a lot of Excel <laughs> work and but I learned to manage people in that process. I learned mm. to, to, to optimize UPS is one of the most efficient as, as far as their small package division. They, they've got that down to a science. They've been around a hundred plus years now. And so I spent five years there. And then after I graduated, um, I was fortunate. I, I earned a scholarship to do a, a project on their supply chain solutions side, which was mm. their main park. They've got multiple distribution centers, but their biggest area was right there in Louisville as well. They had a campus and um, several warehouses. And so I was able to transition over there and I began my career on the supply chain solution side, which is basically the 3PL division of UPS. And I spent 12 years there. Mm -hmm. So I put in 17 good hard years at UPS, got a lot of a lot of knowledge packed into 17 years and started my career there was I've always been in this industry, always been around it. Um, at year 17, I was at ProMat actually, where, okay. where you and I kind of met. Oh, there and you go. I, yeah. I ran into some of my older, some of my employees had, had mm-hmm. gone on out in the industry, I guess you could say. Yeah. And they were working with a company called AHS. And so we went to a, some type of event that AHS was hosting at ProMat. Mm-hmm with one of my old employees and they were in a growth mode. And so we got to talk and we hit it off and I met with those guys and I went and met with one of my now partners, Chuck Frank. Mm -hmm. And I, I jumped out of UPS. Didn't know if I'd ever leave UPS, uh, but (laughs) I left UPS and uh, I transitioned to a systems integration company, AHS. And I Mm -hmm. spent uh, seven years with them. And in 2021, uh, HS, uh, when I joined it, I, I think we had 20 employees and we were on just a growth trajectory mm-hmm. and we had a lot of success with bringing on some new robotic technology partners and, mm-hmm. and just systems partners and just traditional what I call material handling partners. They, they've been an industry, well-known name, good company, a family owned business, uh, had recently sold prior to I joined, prior mm-hmm. to me joining. But when I joined, it just really, it, it, not because it was me, but just that the yeah. elements were right. You know, yeah. COVID was coming up. We were in growth mode. They had sold the business. They were willing to invest and make some investments that maybe as a private company you don't do, but the, right. the, the new company was willing to make some investments. Yeah, and yeah. We really grew it, grew it six to eight X, grew nice. a lot of employees, had a lot of success, and it, it got some attention and it was picked up by some private equity. Mm-hmm. And I guess the clean way to say it is the private, the people of the private equity and the new leadership group yeah. and the old leadership group, there were just difference of opinions. Uh, okay. There were differences yeah. of how you run a business, <laughs> how, where, where the business was going. And so there was a parting of the ways. And then in January of 2022 now, almost 18 months ago, there were four, the leadership team from HS that we went out and we, we started Zion Solutions Group. So mm-hmm. I've got three equal partners, Chuck Frank, who a lot of people in the industry will know, his son, Jordan Frank, and then a, another another guy named Drew Eubank, who I've known Drew for several years. But we, mm-hmm. we were the nucleus of that team, oh. responsible for a lot of the growth, a lot of the culture, had a really good team we'd put around at HS. And so we decided that we wanted to spend the rest of our careers together and we were pretty good at what we do and enjoyed nice. working with each other. And 
So we, I guess some people call it hang your shingle, but so we started Zion Solutions Group. And okay. uh, I talk too much, Kevin, but 25 <laughs> years plus in the industry, been around it my whole career. It's all I've ever done. I tell a lot of people I grew up on the concrete, so I supported a lot yeah. of the operations at UPS. <laughs> and I, I steal this from a guy who told me, um, um, oh, I'm going to forget the name of the company now, but we were at a customer site one time and I asked a guy a question. He told me I needed to go talk to the carpet walkers that he was just a concrete walker. So <laughs> I'm a self-described concrete walker. I grew up on the floor yeah. supporting the operations, optimizing it, industrial engineering, and did a bunch of different stuff at my time at UPS. Got a wealth of knowledge and experience globally. I uh, worked mm-hmm. all over the globe for them, mainly North America, but yeah. 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 Definitely yeah. interesting journey. I mean, I, I'm curious like in the beginning there, you know, obviously you said you started working at, at UPS loading planes and in and, and college. Right. So obviously that was probably just, you know, needed a job, needed to help pay for college, those types of things, expenses. But I'm, I'm curious, like what really caught your attention about the industry that made you want to kind of, I guess, dig in and, and be there for, you know, 17 years and now going on, you know, 25 plus years of being within this this warehousing distribution logistics industry? Yeah. I mean, I think it starts with your education. So Mm -hmm. when I, when I started school, I probably like a lot of people, I didn't really know what my path was. Yeah. I I, I wouldn't say I was particularly, I was a good student. Mm -hmm. It came easy to me in a County school. Okay. Um, I had a rude awakening when I got to engineering school of how much harder I needed to work and my lack (laughs) of, you know, homework and discipline skills. So I, I knew I wanted to do something or I thought I did in engineering. I started out kind of a, down a path of civil engineering mm-hmm. and through some of they, they had a fundamentals of engineering, which was basically just a summary of all the different engineering disciplines when my mm-hmm. freshman year. And I had a, a professor who I have had on our podcast, John Usher, who okay. taught that class. He was out. He was part of the industrial engineering group and. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but then when he talked about what industrial engineers do, I said, that's, that's, I think the engineering I could do. I wasn't a guy that wanted to sit in a cubicle, didn't particularly feel like I was smart enough to design the next big thing mechanically or in Mm -hmm. civil. I didn't really want to be responsible for a bridge that has a lot of people's lives in it. It just that (laughs) those things didn't interest me. But what interested me was, some of the brands that hired industrial engineers, UPS Mm. being one of those, I knew they were out our back door. I'd already committed to working there just to help supplement with college. I grew up pretty, pretty modest means. Mm. My my family's more blue collar. You know, we didn't, I didn't, I didn't have a silver spoon in my mouth when I came out. I had to pay for my college education. It was always part of it and had a great support system, but UPS, Coca-Cola, Disney, and the way he described industrial engineering, which was really, I I call it the people's engineering. You get to work with people, you get to work with systems. So that was probably the first thing. Mm -hmm. And then once I got involved with UPS, it was just, there's a lot of engineering industrial wise and what you do on a daily basis. It's common sense. How do you make something Mm -hmm. easier, better? And I think I've made a career out of that, of just working with people, listening to their problems, How do you help make them better? It's not about being smarter, but it's really about working together and you just improve a process. You improve Mm -hmm. a system, you help people. And then it just kind of grew from there. I just, sometimes you wake up and you're in the right place at the right time. And I was fortunate to work with a lot of good people that looking back, they didn't have to move me into the engineering department. They didn't have to work with me to let me move over to the supply chain solution side they didn't have to let me do a lot of those things. And it's just, you look back in your career and you're like, man, that that's pretty cool how I ended up there. And I ended up with these people and you thank the ones that got you there, but it was mainly because I like to talk. I like to meet with people. I like to lead people. I like to improve processes. I wasn't smart enough to do the other engineering disciplines, but I was pretty good (laughs) at numbers. I'm pretty good at processes. I'm pretty good at going in and looking Mm -hmm. at call it maybe an operation on fire. And I, I've, I've got, the ability to walk in and say, okay, let's attack it. Let's fix it. Let's get okay. it better. And, and that's what drew me to it. And then I just happened to be in the right place with a great company like UPS that allowed me to, to hone my skills and do mm-hmm. it and travel the world to do so and travel all over. And it was, it just, it just kind of all worked together, but 
Nice. Nice. All yeah. right. Good stuff. I mean, definitely great to, to hear the journey and always interested to kind of hear how people end up in this industry too, because I think it's always a, it's always a, a different story, I think, which I think is very interesting. So, so now I, obviously you, you've had a lot of experience in, in the industry and I, I think, you know, with uh, 25 years, especially if we look at the last 25 years of the industry, a lot of a lot of change, right, in, in the way things have looked and, and technologies that have come into play and all those different things. So obviously, you know, you're, you're very aware of what's going on in the industry and, and talking to different brands and, and companies that are, are doing things on the distribution fulfillment side. So I, I'm curious, you know, from your perspective and, and who you've been talking to and what you've been hearing, what would you say are, are some of the biggest problems companies are, are kind of facing now when it comes to their warehousing distribution fulfillment needs or, or what they're trying to accomplish by fulfilling those customer orders. We'll be back after a quick break. You hear a lot about supply chains these days because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood, and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Join me for insightful interviews with thought leaders and industry experts. We discuss how optimizing supply chains can break down the barriers that are holding businesses back. That's All Business, No Boundaries by DHL Supply Chain. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, so we, we spend a lot of time in the retail side, e-commerce side. So a lot of that is is just talking about just the volumes and getting product to customers and how you right. do it quicker. How do you do it more efficient? How do you do it with a, a higher return on your investment, which usually translates into, I mean, there's only so many inputs in the 3PL side of the business, in the e-commerce side, the omni-channel, the retail. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a numbers game of space and, and labor and how your system and, and ultimately the inventory that you call. So we, we see a lot of our customers are trying to solve. Well, let me pick out a couple areas. Sure. So one, just the, the, the no brainer is how do you get faster and more efficient at what you're doing? Their, their products growing, their ability to service customers, they're they're having a lot of success with getting their product out to the market and so how do i store more in less space how do mm -hmm. i use more less people to get more out the door while maintaining my quality and right. so that's really more the retail side we also deal in aerospace we deal in the pharma and healthcare side their needs are their problems are, are similar but they they solve them in a different manner so quality yeah. might be more important obviously in healthcare and when a patient and mm -hmm. it's a it's a patient not a package is what one of the mantras that ups healthcare right. used to do and it just <laughs> it, it really resonates right mm -hmm. you got to get the right product to the patient you got to get it it's got to be 100 percent right if you ship the wrong pair of shoes you ship a size eight pair of shoes instead of a nine there's not somebody that's life's potentially depending on that. Yeah. But mainly what we do is, is we go in and we have a, we have a six step process called the Zion life cycle that we go in, we do a discovery session and we approach industry a little different, Kevin, as we, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's different. It's just a different play on the word. Just so when we go in, we, we want to solve problems. That's ultimately at the end of the day, we want to build trust. We mm -hmm. want to build a relationship. This industry, that's the backbone of this industry, as I'm sure you can attest to. Yeah, it's just, absolutely. It's a huge industry, but man, it's so small and there's so many yeah. good people. But we go in with the mindset of what pain do you have? What kind of transformation are you trying to make, Mr. Customer? And, and then we really just ask a lot of questions and we listen and we see what problems they have. Mm. And we approach it as we want to solve problems as a Opposed to maybe some traditional systems integrators, they got a group of partners yeah. and technologies that they represent, and they go out and they try to find problems that those technologies solve. We really approach it the opposite way. We going to go in and see what problem it is, and then if I've got a partner that solves that problem, which a lot of times we do, mm -hmm. or multiple partners that could solve it different ways depending on where a customer is. Example: they they may not want to invest in high-end automation, robotics, right. and technology. They may just want to get more efficient at their storage. And so yeah. we've got partners that that can solve those problems. And the biggest problem we're seeing is labor. 
Mm. How are how are companies strategically trying to get ahead of the growth that's in front of them? How do they get faster at how they get their product out the door? And and just really, there's there's kind of a weird space with COVID that hit. I, th- I think you saw a, just kind of a cycle of everybody almost went too far to the right. They yeah. uh, they wanted to just make these huge investments, and now I think with some of the economic conditions that are in place, you're seeing people really kind of pull back. And, right where it's going to land is somewhere in the middle, mm. but it's ultimately about what, what transformation the companies are looking for and, and mm. where they're at. We, we work with customers that just, they aren't ready for robotics and technologies and high end automation. Yeah. And then we work with customers that they absolutely, that's what they're willing and wanting to invest in. And, mm. and so we just, we help guide, we, we call it, we, we want to deliver a memorable experience, Kevin, that's yeah. our vision and guide intelligent change. And so for mm-hmm. us, intelligent change is meet the customer where they're at, what problems they need solving. And yeah. if it's gravity conveyor, great. If it's full blown goods to person robotic or a shuttle system, mm-hmm. ASRS, we, we can meet them there. So yeah. Interesting. Really general how I answered that question, but mainly <laughs> it's labor, it's space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's it's how are how are they growing themselves in the future? And there's a lot of competition in the market today. And um yeah, there's a lot companies of companies are trying to figure where does their dollar go the most that ultimately gets their product to their customer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's interesting there too. And I, I mean, it's interesting as you touched on, you know, how the companies, some companies, you know, they kind of threw a ton of money, invested a lot in, in you know, whether it's more facilities, expanding their network or, or automation and stuff during that pandemic. And then you see kind of the the pullback a little bit and, and trying to figure out, you know, where's the where's the level set and, and, you know, how do we re-strategize now that maybe we, we added on too much capacity, right. And, and we don't need that much capacity anymore. But I, I guess in that same sense where you, you're saying, you know, some, some people are, are, they're ready for automation and that's what they want to do versus some people that are not there yet. And I, I think there's certainly kind of the, the narrative out there in a sense that, you know, you, you have to get some type of automation in order to, to compete now. And it's really kind of, there's no question of, of bringing it in, but I'm, I'm curious, like how many times or, or, you know, do you have examples where you're going in talking to a customer, potential customer, client and saying, you know, they're saying that they think they need to bring in automation and robotics in order to, to increase their, their throughput capacity. But the reality is like, you know, there, there's different things that they can do and before they get to that point to, to help them solve their problems. Yeah, we've actually got a real example. I can't share the, the we call them a logo, the name yet. Sure. Yeah, you, you certainly would know them. <laughs> they are a they're more of a software technology company that's getting into warehouse and fulfillment and trying. And it's really okay. not micro fulfillment, Yeah, but it's kind of micro fulfillment. That's not your traditional, you know, warehouse and distribution, 3PL, Mm -hmm. have a big box. It's more smaller regional areas that can supplement and complement their existing network, which is kind Mm -hmm. of a different business right now. Yeah. And I wish I could tell you the name and make a lot more sense than that, but (laughs) such is life, right? But till, till we, till we get to that point, but their three to five year goals and what they're wanting to invest in is they're wanting, I don't want to call them shiny objects, but they see the pro mats. They see the next wave of technology. They see and they hear what other companies are investing in. And sometimes you can get caught up in that. And so what we're doing is we we typically will start with that discovery process. Mm -hmm. And then that'll lead to more of a, you know, we develop a scope of work and we do do an analyze portion of, of, of how we approach a project. But we've asked them to take more of a consulting approach of saying, let's let us give you options of how you can utilize some of these technologies out there. Mm -hmm. And they don't need to start there. They they need some, they need some sortation, but their rates don't, their their rates don't qualify, don't need the higher level sortation today. Mm -hmm. We want them to be mindful about don't just, you don't want to throw away capital. You want to, you want to be able to reuse and you want to be able to grow into it. And so the easy thing to do, for us as a systems integrator, just because of how we get paid would be to go out and sell them the shiniest object that's got the highest cost <laughs> and 
Yeah. That's what they're wanting, and you put them in place. But that's that's not what our we we don't feel like that satisfies them and solves their problem right. It's not yeah. the right process, and we're looking for long term meaningful partnerships. And ultimately, you have to put your head on your pillow at night and feel good about how you solve a problem for a customer and did you do the right thing. And right. so this customer rambling a little bit, but this customer has has their eyes on the higher end of the automation stage or, okay. or graph. I'm using the wrong word there, but yeah. the the higher end automation, the robots and technologies and where they're at today is less. They need more traditional material handling mm. that's going to grow into the robots and technology with really a solid foundation of they, they've got to make the right investment in the software that can grow to where they may get in three to five years. Right. And so we're walking them through that path and we're, I don't, it, it's not really turning away work. It's just more of an education process yeah, yeah. and how we, we want to guide them towards that. And we want to tell them what their options are and really educate them and kind of just slow them down a little and say, let's make good decisions. Cause if you don't, mm -hmm. you'll throw something in and you've probably heard stories of this. I've seen it. There's certainly other ones that do. The easiest part of this is to sell a solution right. to sell a concept mm -hmm. And it looks great and PowerPoint wise, and it sounds great and you yeah. get to sell it great and you get your partners tell you it's going to be great to work. But that's mm. where I think the concrete walking comes into play is <laughs> I've been on yeah. the floor when you turn the switch on and yeah. guess what? Not it great. didn't work. Yeah. And so we spend a lot of time educating our customers on that. We spend a lot of time, ultimately it's their decision, but we mm. try to educate them on the right intelligent change and what to go through. And this customer, we're going through that process with them. And then there's others that are thinking the other way. They're being too conservative. They only know what they know. I think a lot of people in this industry, you kind of get 25 years in, sounds like a lot, and you get a lot of experience. Yeah. But the creativity sometimes could get at, at the end of your career. You probably mm -hmm. met some people like this. It's like you've done this the same way for 20 years or 15 right. years or 10 years, and you kind of get stuck in this rut of like your creativity dies off. Mm. And you only can do the traditional system or something that you've known that's worked and you don't think outside the box. And I think that's one of the real advantages that Zion has. And I've got two of the most creative people in the industry, Drew yeah. and Jordan. Mm -hmm. I don't say that Chuck and I aren't, but it's it's they're way more creative than me. And I don't have the ego that has to get in front of them to say that they're they're creative of how do you solve problems differently. Yeah. And so we we've got a customer right now that's another major brand that you would recognize that mm -hmm. they're thinking pick modules, they're thinking traditional selective pallet rack, and yeah. they've got an extremely high skew count. And they've got a lot of stores that they're brick and mortar that they're trying to go to. And mm -hmm. they came to us and said, well, we want to invest in this. And we're like, well, that's really where goods to person and some of our technology partners, mm -hmm. that's the problem they're solving. Yeah, And that's what this whole technology was developed around and so we're going to give them we're going to show them both and say you mm -hmm. you can do ultimately either it's your decision but let us educate you let us guide that intelligently and and share it with them so you see both ends of the spectrum right yeah yeah it's very interesting and i, I think it, it is interesting too to like you said you know i think a lot of companies and you know certainly certainly this year i mean it's it's been for the past couple years right but certainly this year i mean you, you walked into promat and it was just like Anywhere you look, there's automation, robotics, you know, it's just all over the place. And and I think, you know, to your point, like it, it's very easy for somebody to walk in there that doesn't necessarily have any automation or robotics in place yet. And, and just, you know, like you said, get that shiny object syndrome, like, oh man, like this is so cool. Like this is what we need. Right. And, and then, and like, to your point, it's like, well, you, you don't really need that yet. Right. Like you, you're not, you're not there yet. There's a lot of other things to put in, I think foundationally or even just, you know, things that can put you in place right now to handle your, your throughput and, and capacity with a little bit of buffer of growth before you really need to take that, that big leap and, by the time you get to that point, like, you know, your, your operation could look totally different and, and the product mix it and all those types of things. So to that point, I guess I'm, I'm curious when a company is looking into trying to automate or, or bring robotics in, I, I mean, with the kind of the rapid rate that 
technology in our space is evolving and and new startups are coming in and new type of equipment is coming in, all these different things. I, I mean, what is your advice to someone who's starting to think about this? Like, like how far down the road should they really be thinking? Because I, I think it used to be like, you know, we have a, a five-year plan and then like a 10-year plan kind of thing, but technology is changing so fast. I mean, do you think thinking about investing in something for a, a five-year plan is is too long to think about? Should it be, be doing it in like shorter chunks of time, like shorter chunks of growth? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a really good question. And we, mm-hmm. we, we've talked about this internally as some, what is the right, I don't know that there's a right answer because every, every different yeah. company has a different perspective. Mm-hmm. I think if you're an end user and you're doing your own distribution and fulfillment and you know you you have you have the ability to understand where strategically you're investing in your product and and how diversified it is or is going to be, I think you've got a little better roadmap of of mm-hmm. what's the right investment for you. So if you if you own the customer experience, if you own getting it to shelf and you're just your your core competency is just not distribution and fulfillment. Mm-hmm. I think you can look at a longer time span to make that investment in based on, you know, your product's going to be, I don't, if if you're a makeup company, you know, you're always going to be in makeup and you know, there's only so much difference in SKUs and how the sizes and what you're ultimately going to do. You're going to have a decent idea of your roadmap of growth, whether you're going to brick and mortar, whether you're a direct to consumer, whether you're, you're some combination of the two. So I think you can make those decisions and look at a longer investment period. We deal a lot with 3PLs and I grew up in the 3PL mm-hmm. and, and some of my partners did as well. And you don't have more than a three to five year experience. So the ability yeah. to balance that is, is the more flexible, the automation, the more flexible, the technology that you're putting in both systematic and hardware. So um, you have to balance those because what you're doing today is going to be different. It's almost like a multi-client type problem that you're solving yeah. and it's yeah. a tough problem it's it's not an easy problem mm-hmm. there are technologies today that that are solving that differently but we've been advising that there's a lot of things that are going against so there's some things that i would i don't know that there's an answer i can give the end users but what i would guide them in is is just and it's not a selfish plug it's why systems integrators exist mm-hmm. right. is find you a trusted partner that can help you work and I know you've talked to several. I know you bring several on. There's yeah. a lot of great companies out there. <laughs> yeah. Find a partner that you can trust, put your trust in, that has your best interest uh, in mind, that their sole purpose in life is to explore the technologies and explore mm-hmm. the different applications and, and be good at it. Um, like Zion is, is, is understanding the dynamics. The world changes every day, and it's only getting faster. Yeah. And depending on whether you're more conservative or more risk, most of the U S North American market is not an early adopter. They're, yeah. they're usually more risk adverse. They mm-hmm. usually are at best fast followers, mm-hmm. but have you a trusted advisor? There's places you can do. There's a lot of negotiation techniques. Now there's, there's as a service models, there's all right. types of those popping up that can get you. You think of something like the locust type applications where right. you've got yeah. those in and, you know, hardware, we're, we're trading in our iPhones every two to three years as a, as a consumer. Yeah. So think through as you get some of these newer hardwares and technologies and make sure you're negotiating in more of as a service model mm-hmm. and licensing to where you can get the newest technology, the newest iteration and just have the conversation. So I don't know that the world's ever going to be where one solution fits all. I think you get, try yeah. to get as flexible as you can. You try to negotiate. I would I would never negotiate out a five or 10 year deal on a brand new technology or software because yeah. the world is changing too fast. Absolutely. Um, and then have a trusted partner, whether it's an integrator or whether it's a trusted OEM. There's a lot of really good OEMs. That's their core. That's what they do. Mm-hmm. And then I think you also got to look at it as well. It's like there's not one solution fits all. That's where we found that's where we had a lot of success at our last company. And that's where we're really finding success today is there's all this traditional material handling. Mm-hmm. So we would classify sortation, sliding shoe sorters, even the higher speed sortation, racking and platforms, pick tunnels, pick modules, how you have a hybrid solution and system with the newer robotics and technology. 
Mm. whether you put in a point to point AMR, whether you put in a goods to person system or whether you go higher up the automation stream yeah. and then how you tie that in with, with the software that you're using. I think it's a complex problem and there's not one solution that fits everything for a diverse customer. Mm. The ones that do, it's great, but yeah, yeah. you can put in the right goods to person system. That's going to handle your C and B movers, but you still got to deal with your A movers and you still right. may have to, to batch pick those and you still may have to consolidate those. You still may have to transport them and in feeds and discharge conveyor and get them in and out. And if you don't have a system and a control system or, or, you know, a robotic management system, a fleet system Mm -hmm. that's coordinating and orchestrating all those efforts, I don't really care what technology you got. You're you're going to start and stop. You're going to start and stop and you're not going to be as efficient. So yeah, long way of saying, get a trusted partner. I think you got (laughs) to ask really good questions. Mm-hmm. It's okay to do that. They're major investments and and just you can be a fast follower. And that's yeah. personally my style. I'm a little more conservative. I'm mm-hmm. I'm not a super risk, you know, going out and, and seeking risk and certainly take yeah. that approach for our customers of we spend it like it would be our money. If I was putting my money in my check and writing it and we we take that pretty serious because mm-hmm. you can cripple somebody's supply chain and yeah. Can absolutely. ruin their business if you make wrong decisions. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I, I've certainly heard of you know some some failed large projects in the in the past as well. I think we all have, and it certainly can be very detrimental, especially when you know you're you're trying to to move a lot of product, and you know you're, you're putting the majority of your eggs, I guess, so to speak, into one basket there and one solution. Yeah. You can definitely have a lot in the balance there. So really interesting to to talk to you here, and really interesting to to hear your thoughts on kind of the the industry and and your experience as well i'm curious before we wrap up here as you you know you mentioned that you know you uh, as a partner you're, you're always looking at you know what's the the latest technology and, and you know making sure that you're you're staying on on top of that i'm curious right now you know what's what's maybe the most exciting automation technology or software or solution in our space that you're you're seeing out there right now I think there's a lot. So I'm always the guys looking in the future. So we're, mm-hmm. we're talking with a couple of humanoid companies okay. that mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't have it pinpointed when they're going to be in the warehouses, but yeah. you know, you saw there was one at, at ProMat. Yeah. Uh, agility. Uh, I think. Right? Yeah. Agility yeah. was there and they, yeah. they, they made a splash, but we've been talking for several months now to a couple of different humanoid companies really like, you know, mm-hmm. we're, we're talking at the CEO and the founder level and, how can we work together? How can we be part of solving the problem before mm-hmm. it's a product to sell? Mm. And so really interested in that. I think they're going to come down the road. Yeah. We've, we've got a couple of trusted software partners. I'm always trying. We're always trying to solve that problem because software is just such a, such a complex problem. Mm. And it's probably the hardest piece of the integration game of just having the right partner in the software that can do a little or do a lot. Yeah. We've got a couple of really good partners that we're working with on it that have just, you know, done really good jobs. We've worked together for several years, several successful implementations. And then technology wise, we we really we're, we're partnered with Hytrol. I mean, they're 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 a great company that does what I call the traditional material handling system. We had Mitch Smith, their CRO was on our podcast last week and okay. We just talked about they focus on one thing in mm-hmm. conveyance. That's what they focus on. And they're yeah. they're the best, in our opinion, integrator partner for conveyor mm. in terms of just how they approach it. They only go through an integrator channel. We've worked with others, and there's a lot of really good people in, in the world. I'm not a guy that says this is best and the only way it can be best, but Hytro does a really nice job. And then robots and technologies, I'm going to plug a couple of our partners, so high robotics. Okay. We're talking with those guys. I know that team really well. Mm-hmm. We really like their application. We really like the density of storage, the ability for them to go high and as high as they can go, and just the flexibility of of what they do and how they do it is, we think, a, a competitive advantage. Mm-hmm. And companies are starting to see that. We've got several in the pipeline. We've got a couple of verbal contracts that we hope to, to, to announce fairly soon. Mm-hmm. But we really like their product. The, one of the biggest things we like about their product is the ability to take the tote out of the system. So a lot of these right. goods to persons 
they don't want it. They want it to stay inside their ecosystem. They don't want yeah, it to yeah. tote in and out. Once it's in, they want it in. Mm-hmm. High is really indifferent. So one of the biggest things they do is bring it out. And then another one you probably heard of them is adverb technologies. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, we've we, had them on. We, yeah. we know their leadership team really well, and we've got a lot of pipeline work with them. And we really like their product portfolio diversity. They've got some, they've got several different options that can put together a good system. And it's under one house instead of having to piecemeal multiple, mm. multiple different companies together in a technology stack and then trying to figure out how you control it. We, we really like that about Adverb and their team. Both those teams are phenomenal. We're super big on culture. You got to like the people you work with. Mm-hmm. You got to, you know, we say all the time when we started Zion, it's like, I'm only going to work with good people the rest yeah. of my career. I'm going to strive <laughs> to do it. I'm going to work with good people. Yeah. I'm going to have good partners and I'm going to help good customers. And if it doesn't yeah. fall in that, like, mm, we're not doing it. But Adverb and Hire are two technologies and their portfolios that we're, we're really excited about and, and finding that we can solve a lot of problems with. We're talking to others. We're talking to some mm. picking place. None of them are formal out. You know, partnership games a little different. And, and yeah. you have a lot of conversations, but you really don't until you worked on a project together. Is it really a partnership or is it just conversation? So we've got a lot of good people we're talking to and a lot of activity in the robotics and technology area. But the two that we're probably most excited about right now and having the most problems that we found to solve with have been high and and adverb. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Very curious to always hear that. What's what's exciting to people out there. And we've had we've had adverb on the, the show before and, and definitely yeah. really cool what they're doing and, and high as well. Very cool. We need to get them on the show. Actually, we haven't had them on yet. But so really interesting to, to talk to you here, Jim, and, uh, you know, learn about kind of your your background, your experience, and, and your thoughts on what's happening in the, the industry right now. So if people are listening and they want to get in touch with you or get in touch with Zion Solutions Group, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, I think we, we do most of our our marketing and our, our, I guess, our outreach is on LinkedIn. So you can yeah. find us on LinkedIn, go out, follow us. We'd love to have you. We've got content. We post weekly. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, so you can find me on LinkedIn and then you can get back to Zion. And yep. we've got a website. You can reach out to us through our website. It's thezsg.com. We wanted a shorter website, so we call ourselves Zion Solutions Group, but we just we abbreviate it ZSG. So thezsg.com. Okay. And the industry's so small. I mean, you, you can find us in yeah. any way that you can. We'd love to, we'd love to meet. We always love meeting new people, new partners. And, Kevin, I'm appreciative of the opportunity. I I should have asked your opinion on a suit, few of these questions back. We don't probably have time for that. But <laughs> I'd love to hear your opinion on the newest uh, technology. Yeah. What excites you? But we'll yeah, do that another more. time. I'll, I'll come on. I'll come on your podcast to talk about. There that. we How go. About that. There we, we go. That. <laughs> yeah. All right, great. So we'll put all the information about Zion Solution Group and how to get in touch with Jim at thenewwarehouse.com as well so people can easily find it and definitely uh, check out their podcast too if you're looking for another podcast to listen to, the Zion Experience, correct? Is it yeah, the podcast, right? Yep. And we'll put a link to that as well at thenewwarehouse.com. So Jim, thank you so much for your time on the show today. You've been listening to the New Warehouse Podcast with Kevin Lawton. Subscribe and check us out online at thenewwarehouse.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want more content from the New Warehouse, check out our new video series called All Hands on LinkedIn. Just search for the New Warehouse on LinkedIn and follow along.